All right. Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Phil Kwan. I'm one of the pastors here at Wells Branch Community Church, and I am so excited to be with you guys here today to share a little bit of my story and what God has done in my life. But more importantly, I'm excited to share with you guys from God's Word. Now, before we jump into all that, I would love for us to pray together one more time. So if you guys could join me in prayer. And I want to invite all of us with our eyes closed and our heads bowed to take a moment to rest. Wherever you're coming from, whoever you are, whatever your last, whatever this past week was like, and whatever you have going on next week, I want us to, I want to invite us to set this time aside, make it sacred. And if you're up for it, I would invite us to pray and ask God to speak to us and meet with us today. Next, if you could pray for me, that God would speak through me, that my words would be his words, and that they would make sense to you and create a meaningful change in your life. Well, Lord, we thank you and praise you for this time. Thank you for your word, and thank you for this thing called marriage. We ask God that you would teach us something today. This is your time. These are your people. Do with us whatever you like. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I wanted to start off this morning by asking us to consider a question in your mind. And that question this morning is this. What was the worst team that you have ever been on in your life? What was the worst team you've ever been on? Just think about it. Relive all those painful memories again. What was the, most pain what was the worst team you've ever been on ever? As I was thinking about this question this week, I realized that I've been a part of some really, really great teams over the years. I've also been a part of some pretty terrible ones, but if I had to pick one team that I would say, yes, that's the one, that's the worst team I've ever been on, it would probably be my eighth grade school soccer team. That would be it. Now, to give you a little bit of context and background, I did not grow up playing soccer. Like, I didn't do that. My parents didn't put me in a league or anything like that. The only reason why I decided to play soccer that year is because I had nothing going on that semester. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I figured uh, people still play soccer around the world, right? That's still a thing. And because um, my school was so small that everyone who tried out made the team, and I just really needed a win that year. You know, I was just like, man, I just need to make it somewhere. So I decided to try out for the team, and I made the team. Uh, and <clears throat> the cool thing about that team was that we were all friends. Like, we all knew each other. We all started in sixth grade together. We all hung out together. We ate lunch together. We played video games together. All that kind of stuff we did together. And so we got together. We got our jerseys, and we're like, wow, this is a great team. Well, we're already friends. We already like each other. This is going to be an awesome year. But what ended up happening is we played 10 games that season, and out of those 10 games, we lost all 10 games. Yeah. And we would lose them by a margin of three goals or more. <laughs> many, of, many of times we would score zero. We'd get shut out of these games. And we couldn't figure out why. I mean, we were all friends. We liked each other. We were always, like, hanging out together. We enjoyed each other's companies, but we couldn't figure out why we kept losing. And it wasn't until about game five that we realized the reason why we kept losing games was because we sucked at soccer. <laughs> like, we just genuinely couldn't do it. Uh, I played goalkeeper, not because I knew how to play goalkeeper, but because I was the person with the least amount of experience, and that's what you do with people who don't know how to play. You stick them in the goal. Any goalkeepers out here? Yes, you know my pain. And there are many, many times the reason why we would lose these games is because my defense would literally shoot on our own goal. Like, what are you doing? We, we're not going to get anywhere, guys. And over the weeks, our friendships started to deteriorate. And week after week after week, loss after loss after loss, eventually we started getting frustrated with each other. We started yelling at each other. And by the end of the season, many of us were not friends anymore. There was, I remember this one game, uh, you know when like teams clear the bench and they rush the field? Well, that happened, except it was just our team. We rushed the field to fight each other. And the other team was just standing around like, 
sh should we do something? I, the clock is still going. I, I guess we could just score another goal. Like, that's literally what happened. It was the worst experience of sport in my life. Now, why am I telling you this? Because, believe it or not, for many of us, this picture, this is our culture's experience of marriage. Ooh, that's terrible, isn't it? But it's totally true. Many of us have this idea of marriage where we like each other, but for some reason we can't get this thing going. That's our experience of marriage. If you guys are just joining us this week, we're in the middle of a series called How to Be Married. Because, and our church is taking a, a deep dive, six week look into what it means to be married. How is it that we navigate this thing called marriage? Uh, and this week is special, not because I'm preaching, though it is special for me. Uh, it's special because five of the six weeks have to do with the internal mechanics of how to relate to each other. Uh, week one, we talked about self-reflection, then we talked about communication, we were going to talk about parenting, sex, and financial management. All of those things are how to navigate the minefield of relating to each other. But if we're honest, all of those things, what they produce is a good defense, how to protect, safeguard, and bolster your marriage. But this week is different because we're not talking about defense this week, we're talking about offense. What is a marriage for? What is the mission of marriage? Because marriage is a team. It's not the game, it's the team. What is the marriage set out to do? That's the game. Why are you married? And that's really it. The core of what we're talking about today can be summed up in this question, and I want you to ask this question to yourself and to your spouse. Why are you married? Why are you married? You could turn to your spouse right now and ask, why are we married? Don't answer it. That, that could be kind of intense. If you're single in this room and you want to be married, the question is, why should you get married? What's the point? What's the purpose of marriage? And for me, I had this perspective of marriage that many of us, many of you, probably have. And it's this. When I was younger, I believed that the point of marriage is to love someone. It's to love someone with all your heart all the days of your life. I thought that that was the purpose of marriage. And can I tell you something right now? If that is your reason for being married, if that's your philosophy of marriage, that marriage is for two people to love each other for the rest of their lives, that perspective, that philosophy of marriage is absolutely and completely wrong. That is not why you get married. Now, it is good to like each other, yes. It is good to love one another, but that's not the reason why your marriage exists. I struggled with this a ton when I was in middle school. As a seventh grader, my greatest ambition and dream was to get married. I know that's really intense for a 12-year-old. <laughs> it was like, my, my goal in life is to get married and love someone with all my heart and also to catch all 150 Pokemon. That was yeah. like, <laughs> what is going on? But it was true. My heart's desire, the purpose of my life was to find someone to love. And sure enough, in seventh grade, there was a girl sitting next to me in math class, and we would spend all of math class talking because math is boring. Yes. So we would talk all class, and then we would walk each other to uh, our next class. We'd talk in the hallway. We would talk at lunch. We would have lunch together. We would hang out outside of school, and we just started dating because I thought, yes, this is it. This person is someone I love to be around. I could see myself loving this person forever and ever and ever. And as cute as that might sound, a lot of us have that experience. We want that. I wanted to love her, and she would love me, and I would give to her, and she would give to me, and I would sacrifice for her, and she would sacrifice for me, and she would lay down her life so that she could support me, and I would lay down my life so I could support her, and we would love each other, and we would go to fancy Italian restaurants and stare at each other over candlelight dinners while soft music played in the background. That, that was it, baby. That's what I was going for. But sure enough, after a couple months, we had basically run out of things to say to each other. You can only compliment someone's eyes so many times before it seems fake. And as much as we tried to push this relationship together, it wasn't working. And we got frustrated with each other, we got annoyed with each other, and then we broke up. And then a couple months later, because we're codependent people, we decided to get back together. And then six months later, we broke up. And then two months later, we got back together. And then eight months later, we broke up. 
and on and on and on and on for seven years we dated from seventh grade to freshman year of college i dated one girl about a hundred times <laughs> because i was so desperate to make it work i didn't understand we were so compatible. We loved the same things. We loved hanging out together. We loved each other. And I was like, this is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with, but we cannot make it work. We always broke up. Why? And eventually I realized we were going in two different directions. Freshman year of college, we broke up for good. I was like, forget it. I am giving up. This is not going to work. And at the same time, while I was anguishing in this like failure to understand what marriage was, I started to pursue God. As a Christian, God was setting my heart and my mind on his purpose for my life. He, he showed me how he rescued me out of the pit of death, out of the pit of hopelessness, and set my feet on solid ground. That Jesus rescues me from my hopelessness, not just to save me from sin and death, but to invite me and adopt me into his family and to send me out to know him, to love him, and to reach people with the life-changing reality of Jesus. And for the first time in my life, I felt like, yes, I am finally running the way I was meant to run. I was finally living life full of meaning and purpose. But I had this desire on the other side to get married. And I thought, these two things are not compatible. The adventure of following Jesus and the settling down of getting married, they are opposites, and they do not exist together. And I just tried to ignore that fact. I didn't know what to do, and many of us are in that situation because many of us think, for those of us who think marriage is about loving another person, uh, uh, liking a person, living your life with that person, the truth is, is that that cannot sustain. It cannot last. And many of us, we either settle down and give up on this dream, give up on the pursuit of God, or we just fight a lot. We just fight. It's either in conflict or we surrender and we give up. And that's not the way that marriage was designed to work. Marriage wasn't designed to work that way. It was designed for something greater than that. Just like a soccer team isn't designed to just hang around with each other and play video games, a soccer team is together because there is a goal and a mission. And that's the question today. What is the purpose of your marriage? And today, we're going to be in the Word of God to take a look at what that looks like. That marriage and mission are not opposites, but in fact, one was created to serve the other. Marriage is not the end, it's a means. It's not the game, it's the team. And marriage was designed for a purpose and a mission, to serve that mission. And we're going to find out what it looks like when a couple, a husband and a wife, say that our marriage exists for the purpose of loving God and reaching people with the gospel. What does that look like? We're going to see it in the book of Acts, chapter 18. If you have your Bible today, you can flip there, Acts chapter 18, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand. And one will be delivered to you by one of our ushers. If you don't have a Bible at all, it is our gift to you. Keep it. And we're going to take a look. And by the way, uh, a lot of us know a lot of verses about good marriage. Love is patient. Love is kind. Husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church. That sort of thing. But there is really only one couple in your New Testament that is presented as a positive example of what marriage is supposed to look like. Did you know that? There's only one couple. There are a ton of singles in there, and we find out later that Peter himself is married, but you never even find out what his wife's name is. But there's only one couple that's presented. It's, like it's like a Jeopardy question, uh, where it's like, who is this couple? Um, there's only one couple that's presented that way, and it's this couple, Priscilla, and her husband, Aquila. And we're going to take a look at what it looks like for a marriage to be on mission for the purpose of glorifying God and reaching people. And it starts this way. Acts chapter 18, verse 1 says this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, uh, who was the emperor at the time, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so in this moment, Paul was preaching the gospel in the city of Athens, and because of the message of the gospel, things got a little dangerous for him. There were riots in the streets, and so Paul left Athens to head to Corinth. 
At the same time, there were all of these Christians and Jews in Rome, and the same thing was happening. There were riots in the streets because of what was going on. And the emperor basically said, hey, listen, I don't want to get, like, like, get tangled up in the weeds of your theological debate, so everybody out. So he kicked all the Jews out, and many of them, including this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, they ended up in the port city of Corinth. Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila from different parts of the world end up in the city together. And it says that Paul went to see them because he was of the same trade. He sa- stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Basically what happens is Paul is walking through the marketplace, and he meets this couple at their tent making store. It would be kind of like, if you, it, for me as an Aggie, if I walked through the domain and I bumped into a couple, and they were wearing Aggie gear, and I was like, oh my gosh, did you guys go to A&M? Yes, we did go to A&M. What class are you? I'm class of 09. Me too. That's awesome. Uh, what did you study? Well, I studied, I, I studied uh, computer science and engineering. Wow, I study that too. Hey, do you want a job? That's basically what happened. They met, this couple met Paul, found out that he was a missionary, come to take the gospel of Jesus to this city, wherever he was going, and that he happened to be a tent maker as well. And they said, hey, our marriage, guess what, Paul? That's exactly what we're here for. That's why we're here. And we have a business. We want to invite you to work with us. That's what they did. The business itself, now see this, Priscilla and Aquila, they own this business together. It wasn't Priscilla's business. It wasn't Aquila's business. It was their business together. But it wasn't the mission of their marriage. Their marriage wasn't Uh, didn't exist so that they could make a lot of money and make their tent making business awesome instead they said they said this business exists so that we can leverage it for the sake of the gospel moving forward and they saw another guy who needed a, a job and said hey you're about that come and work with us that's what they said their mission moved them towards paul and not just their business either uh take a look at what it says in verse three it says that they He worked with them, and he stayed with them. Not only did they leverage their business and their work, but but they also invited Paul to live with them. And if you're a married couple today, you have to understand that as hard as it is to to work in the same place as your spouse, uh, it's hard enough to invite someone, a stranger, into your family business. It's got to be, it's even worse to invite them to come live with you. But that's exactly what they did. Their goal in marriage was not to work a good job so they can make a lot of money. Their goal in their marriage was not to have a nice, safe, comfortable home so that they could, I don't know, uh, entertain parties and have an awesome backyard or raise lots of little kids. That wasn't the purpose of their marriage. Every piece of their marriage, they said, our mission is to reach people with the gospel and we're going to leverage that for the sake of the gospel moving forward. And so that's our first point. Aquila and Priscilla supported the mission of God through their resources together. Whatever they had was not the goal. Their marriage or liking each other or loving each other or making money or pursuing hobbies, that wasn't the mission of their marriage. All of those things were serving the greater mission of them together reaching people with Jesus, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. As uh, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, as they're living together, as they're growing together, as they're working in this tent-making business together, at some point, things get too hot in Corinth, just like it did in Athens and in Rome, and so they are forced to move, or Paul is forced to move. And what happens is that Paul basically says, uh, hey, I have to go, and Priscilla and Aquila, you know what they say to him? They said, you know what, Paul? You can go. We have roots here, and we just got this business thing going, so we can't really leave it. No, that's not what they say at all. Instead, what they do is they sell their house, they pack up their business, and they say, Paul, we see that God is is leading you in the mission of reaching people. We're going to come too. We're going to support you, we're going to resource you, and we want to be a part of that mission too. So they sold everything, and they followed Paul to the city of Ephesus, and that's where we meet them next. In verse 24, chapter 18, verse 24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew about the baptism of John. 
And so in this moment, we see that Priscilla and Aquila and Paul, they are at church together, basically. They go to synagogue together. They're sitting in the pews one Saturday morning, just like we're here sitting in the pews. And it turns out that there's this new pastor, a new preacher that had come to town, come to Ephesus. It would be like if our church hired a new pastor, and, and this week he was going to stand up here and preach to our congregation. And it says that he was eloquent. It said that he was gifted. This young man was fired up, and he was passionate about God and the mission of God. He was excited about it, but he was just a little bit off in his message. He didn't quite know all that there was supposed to be known of Jesus. He didn't have the full story. And so he was preaching with fire, but he was a little bit misguided. And so what happens next? What happens next? It says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, what did they do? When they heard him, Priscilla jabbed her husband on the side and said, can you believe what he is saying? Oh my gosh. It doesn't, no, it didn't say that. It didn't also say, uh, <clears throat> he spoke boldly and then Priscilla and Aquila started live tweeting the sermon and talking about how awful it was. Or they didn't also go to lunch at Schlotsky's with all of their friends and badmouth this preacher behind his back. It didn't say any of that. Instead, what it says is that he began speaking boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They were there in Ephesus to support the ministry of reaching people with the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ, yes, but they were also willing to engage the mission of God as well. And that's our second point. Aquila and Priscilla engaged the mission of God by reaching their neighbors together. Whoever God would put in front of their path, they were not afraid to go after them. Notice also that it says, it doesn't say that Priscilla and Aquila, oh, hearing him, they ran and got Paul, the professional Christian, to go talk to him. It doesn't say that. They were willing to engage themselves. It doesn't also say Priscilla tapped her husband on the shoulder and said, honey, will you please go talk to him? It doesn't also say uh, that Aquila uh, nudged his wife and say, honey, could you get all the wives together and talk to his wife, please? It doesn't say that. It says they took him aside and they taught him. They discipled him because they saw that this man, God had a plan for him. And they're willing to engage the mission together. And by the way, if you don't know anything ap about Apollos, the next time you read about Apollos is going to be in 1 Corinthians. And Paul is going to describe this guy, Apollos. Um, and he's going to put him on the same shelf as the Apostle Peter. As people who are the great defenders of the church, in the early church. Apollos is one of the greatest apologists, one of the greatest defenders in church history. And where did that start? It started right here. When two business people who were married in love with each other and love with God decided that they could not sit back and watch someone fall apart, they engaged the mission together. And it wasn't just Apollos. When they were in Ephesus, they started reaching out to their neighbors, reaching out to their community, reaching out to people who came to their shop. And before long, there was a group of people meeting in their house. There was a community of people meeting in Priscilla and Aquila's house as a group and they shepherded that group. Get it? There was a community of people meeting as a group, and they shepherded them. Priscilla and Aquila, they started the first community group in your Bible. That's what it was, because they could not sit around. They wanted to reach people with the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. They engaged their neighbors. And when I think about this, I think about our community group shepherds. Um, you, you may not know this, but the first Monday night of every month, all the community group shepherds meet together for dinner. We meet at the Live For More Center, we eat together, uh, we play an icebreaker game together, uh, we go through announcements together. We, does this make, like, does that sound familiar? It's basically community group for community group shepherds. We have word time together, that's what we do to encourage each other. We share and we pray for each other. Uh, and uh, this past week, we were talking about this passage, and we were talking about what the goal and the mission of marriage was. And, uh, and, there was, and in my small group, I challenged uh, all of our community group shepherds, and I asked them, what is the purpose and point of your marriage? What is the mission and goal of your marriage in the context of community group? And there was a, uh, and, and uh, 
uh, there was a, a couple, uh, a, a wife there named Kendall Jurassic. Many of you guys know them. It's Ben and Kendall Jurassic. They lead a community group. I looked at Kendall and I asked her, what is the purpose of your marriage? Why are you married? Why, is God, why has God put you together in this community group? And you know what she told me? She said that she and Ben knew of 10 families in their neighborhood, houses, families in their neighborhood. And she said that our goal, Ben and I, Ben and Kendall, their goal was to reach out together, reach out to one of those families every single week. That was their goal. And that was enough to answer the question, but she kept going. She said, our dream is that someday all 10 of those families would join us in our house and we could be a community group together. That was their dream. And when she said that, in my heart, I said, yes, that is exactly what a marriage should be. Because, uh, because Ben and Kendall, they are, in our church, a modern-day Priscilla and Aquila. This ends kind of the, the narrative stream of, of us following this couple around. But they keep popping up everywhere in your New Testament. If you read through the letters of Paul, they just keep showing up over and over and over again because uh, Priscilla and Aquila were always engaged in the mission together. They were some of Paul's best friends. At the very end of his life, his last bits of instruction to uh, to his boy Timothy were to go and encourage Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. Uh, uh, um, the next time we see them is in the book of Romans, and and we're going to go there. Romans chapter 16, verse 3 through 5. You don't have to turn there. It's up on the screen. But Paul is writing a letter to the church in Rome, and he ends the letter with these instructions. He says, greet Prisca, which is a more formal version of Priscilla. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ. By the way, just just a note, now they're in Rome, apparently, They would move five times. They would pack up their business, sell their house, and move to a new city five times in the New Testament narrative. They're in Rome now. Greet them, he says. And then he says, they risk their necks for my life. And what's powerful about that is you see that at some point, we don't know when, this couple risk their lives for the sake of the mission and for Paul's life. They risk their lives. And why this is so important is because for so many of us, we think of marriage as settling down, about, about taking a step back from risks. When you were young and when you were fired up, you were ready to charge ahead. You were ready to lay down your life for this great mission. For the glory of God, you were ready to sacrifice. But now being married means putting down roots, settling down, and giving up on those dreams and those adventures. Where on earth are you getting this from? It is nowhere in your Bible. It is nowhere in the truth. If anything, this couple, they weren't settling down in their marriage. They were saddling up. They ramped up the risks they took in the mission to reach people with Jesus. How many of us, as married men and women, how many of us would be willing to stand up with our spouse and say, we are willing to lay down, not just my life, but I'm willing to lay down our lives. We're willing to lay down our lives so that the gospel can be preached in Austin, Texas. How many of you would do that? That's hard, but that's what, exactly what they did. And what's fun about this is it doesn't explain what happened. Like Paul, Paul just says they risked their, their necks for me, but no one really knows what that means or what happened in that moment. It's like Paul says, hey, make sure you say hi to Prisca and Aquila. I love those guys because of that thing that they did for me once at that place. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it was wild. That's basically what it is. And it doesn't say, hey, greet Prisca and Aquila, but especially Aquila, because that bro, he almost died for me. It doesn't say that. It says that the two of them together risk their necks. And then what's cool is that it says that they, that it says, to whom not only I, Paul, give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. All the churches of the Gentiles. That's basically all the churches. Oh, this couple, because of the risk that they took, in moving the mission of God forward. We are one of those churches, and we owe them thanks because of the risk they were willing to take. They were willing to give up. They sacrificed and risked their livelihood and their business moving from town to town to town. They risked their family, they risked their homes, and here we see that they risked their lives. And that's the final point today. 
is Priscilla and Aquila lived out the mission of God by adventuring together. By adventuring together. If you're single in this room and you want to get married and you think that marriage means giving up on your dreams to pursue God with your whole heart, with your whole mind, with all your strength, if you think that that's what marriage is, you're wrong. If anything, being married means pursuing a mission bigger than yourself in a way that you cannot do on your own. Stop thinking of your future spouse as a liability. He's not a houseplant. She's not a puppy. You guys are meant to be on mission together. And so that's the last point. They live the mission of God by adventuring together. And there's a couple in our church right now, as a great example, there's a couple uh, that was uh, <clears throat> just a couple years ago, they were living uh, up, in, uh, up in Ohio. Uh, it's Joe and Renee Seastat. This is a picture of them. <clears throat> they, they had a very good life. Joe had a great job. They had a great community. They had four beautiful children. They were perfectly content to live in their home. But when they felt the mission of God calling them and drawing them because there were a group of young adults in this city who desperately needed the gospel of Jesus, they said, you know what, we are willing to quit. Joe was willing to quit his job, sell their house, put all of their belongings in two cars, pack up their kids, separate, uh, leave their families so that they can go and engage the mission together. And you know what? Their marriage is stronger because of that. Not in spite of it, but because they pursued the mission together. And that is the challenge for you. What is the point of your marriage? Is it to pursue your hobbies? Is it to have someone that can rub your back at night? Is that what the purpose of your marriage is? Or is it something bigger than yourself? Joe and Renee are Priscilla and Aquila in our church. So what does this mean for us in the 21st century? You say, okay, there's a good example in the New Testament, first century, all that kind of stuff. But what does this mean for us today? Two things to two groups of people, and we're done. First, if you're not a Christian in this room right now, you wouldn't say that you are. Maybe you got tricked here. I don't know. Someone dragged you here. The reality is, is that no mission in this world, no mission that this world can conjure up will be able to satisfy you. No mission that this world can conjure up can give a purpose noble enough for your marriage to work. Nothing. It can't be our marriage exists so that we can make a lot of money. It can't be our marriage exists so that we can build a business empire. It can't even be, and this is gonna, this is gonna hit some of you guys personally, it can't be our marriage exists so that we can raise really great kids. Because what happens what happens when your hobbies start to diverge and suddenly you guys don't like the same things anymore? Is your marriage over? What happens when your marriage is about loving another person and loving to spend time with them? What happens when that dies down? What happens when that ends? Well, you just separate? Your marriage is done? What happens when a, <clears throat> a marriage is about a raising kids and then suddenly your kids grow up and leave the house? What, mission accomplished? We can go our separate ways now? That's not what a marriage is for. Because there is no mission that this world can conjure up that's good enough. Because every one of us has brokenness inside. We are pursuing these false pursuits, these false weak missions to death, to the grave. And God in his great love for us sent his son Jesus Christ because he could not stand for his children to die. He sent his son Jesus Christ to come and rescue us from that brokenness. To take all of our sin and all of our shame onto himself. He died on the cross in your place. And on the third day, he rose again, proving once and for all, he conquered sin and death. Not to just save you from hell, but to invite you into a family and to set your feet on a mission. And marriage is two people saved by grace on mission together. And so you want to save your marriage the only way that can happen is through the gospel. Let Jesus rescue your marriage through the purpose, through the mission of the gospel. For those of us in this room who are Christians today, understand this. Aquila and Priscilla were not trained missionaries. They were not seminary trained pastors. They were not professional Christians. They were lay people. They were regular people who owned a business, and they saw each other not as liabilities or burdens, but they saw each other as partners, teammates and assets 
They did not settle down to get married. Instead, they saddled up. They drew the sword. They charged the head, and they said, I'm going to run with you. You are my running mate. You are my partner in this mission together. What's fun is that six times their names are, are mentioned in your Bible. All six times their names are together. You will never find one without the other. They're always together because this mission was not just an individual one. It was a collaborative one for the two of them. Six times their names are mentioned. Four times Priscilla's name is named first. Two times Aquila, the husband's name, is named first. Four to, why is that important? Because it didn't matter. It didn't matter whose name was first because they were co-equal. They were partners in that mission. When it was Aquila who was running really fast, his wife was there to cheer him on. When it was Priscilla pursuing God, her husband was right there to cheer her on. It didn't matter because they were on mission together. So that's the question. How will your marriage serve in the mission of God? How will your marriage pursue the mission of God? What is the mission of your marriage? I want to challenge you right now to take out a sheet of paper, or when you get home, take out a sheet of paper and write this question down. What is the purpose of my marriage? Why am I married? Write it down. Why am I married? And if that answer does not have eternal consequence, it's not good enough. If you're single in this room, write down the question, why do I want to get married? If it's because you just need someone to love, it's not good enough. This, by the way, is why another date night will not save your marriage. Quit saying that. You don't need another date night. More date nights. That's what we need. We just need to go on another date. Because what happens when your mission is to pursue your career, pursue your goals, pursue uh, your, your idea of a perfect family, pursue raising children, pursue your hobbies? What happens? You go on another date night, you talk about completely opposite things, and then the next 45 minutes you just stare at each other or you stare at your phones. That's not a good date. You don't need another date night. You need a purpose. Your marriage needs purpose and direction. And when you have that, when a marriage, when a husband and wife say, this is the purpose, this is the goal, this is the mission of our lives, this is why we exist together, then suddenly date night, your conversations become rich and full and purposeful and meaningful and satisfying. Your conversations become full of compassion, full of grace, full of generos generosity. You start to pray for each other. You start to pray for and support each other's ministries. That's what happens, and that's what I want for you. And so husbands, release your wives to do ministry. Don't extinguish the little bit of fire that she has to go out and disciple young women. Don't do that. And yes, it's hard to watch a, a horde of small children by yourself. Yeah, that's hard. But when those children are gone, you want a wife that is on fire for Jesus. And wives, release your husbands to do ministry. You complain about how the Bible says respect your husbands. Well, my, hu my husband is not respectable. He doesn't do respectable things. But that moment where your husband says, hey, I think I want to disciple this guy. Hey, I think I want to serve in this church. Don't crush that by saying, I need you at home. Send him out. Say, go. Go meet with those guys. Go do work. Go do the respectable things so that when it's just you and him, you guys have something beautiful to talk about. And husbands and wives, go find something that you love and serve together. Serve together and find the great joy in living for something more than just yourselves. How will your marriage pursue the mission of God? Finally, to wrap up, one last story. I told you that in college, I struggled so much because I thought marriage and mission were two opposite things. And so I decided to just slay marriage and just pursue mission. That's what all I was going to do. And freshman year, second semester, uh, I started serving in an inner city uh, ministry in Bryan. Turns out, Bryan has an inner city. Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, what I would do is there was a group of us that would go to this church in inner city, Bryan, and we put on Friday church, just like Big Fish Club, for those of you guys who do that. It's just like that. Kids from the neighborhood would come, and we'd share Jesus with them. We would love them. We'd play games, and then we would walk them home, and we would pray with their families. That's what we would do, and I loved it. It was like running full speed. It was like chariots of fire. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. That's really what it was like. And as I was serving over the years, I noticed that one of my friends from the dorm, who was also serving, I noticed her. 
because I was in charge of the youth boys, she was in charge of the youth girls, and I just saw her, and I was like, wow, she's awesome. I remember one time this girl, her two best friends uh, invited her to go on a road trip because that's what college kids do. It's like so quintessentially college, right? It's like, hey, come on this road trip with us. And I remember oh, like eavesdropping on this conversation, and she said, I can't. She said, no. And she said, I made a promise to my Pioneers girls that we'd have a sleepover this weekend, and I'm going to keep my promise. And so she did. Her friends went out on this road trip, and she had, uh, you know, six teenage girls from inner city Bryan uh, melting crayons in the oven, which I don't know what that was about, and they would do Bible study together, and they would pray for each other. And I said, that's it. That's it. She gets it. And when I think about my life and my race, I want to run with her. And it turns out she wanted to run with me too. And this is a picture of her. It's Brandy. That, can I tell you, that's where we fell in love. Not on a date, but on the mission field. And that's what I want for you. And as we started to get to know each other and get to, and, and as we saw the mission that God had for us, we saw it lining up. We saw that we were better together than apart. I said, hey, will you run with me for the rest of your life? And she said, yes. And we got married. And that's what our marriage is for. Not so that we can love each other until we die. We love each other because we are running to pursue the mission of God together. We want our lives to look like Prisca and Aquila, partners together in supporting the mission, engaging the mission, and living courageously for the mission of God. When we run hard, when we run well, we're always there to encourage each other and cheer each other on. When one of us gets hurt, it's a lot easier when someone else helps bandage you than when you're trying to bandage yourself, isn't it? Whenever one of us gets hurt, the other person is right there to pick us up. And that's what our marriage is. And that's what I want all of our marriages to be. That's the question. What is your marriage for? Will you, how will you pursue the mission of God together? in your marriage. Let's pray. God, I thank you and praise you for this thing called marriage. Not that it's the end, but God, I thank you that you create a means for us to have a partner in this race, to know you, to love you, and to love the people that you put around us. I pray, God, that you would raise up Priscilla's and Aquila's right here, community group shepherds, people who serve in children's ministry, people who serve in their neighborhoods, people who see their homes, their jobs, their money, their families as resources to leverage for that purpose and mission. And I pray, God, that as we start to lay our marriages down at the feet of Jesus, we'll find that we gain far more than we could have ever imagined or hoped for. And I pray, Lord God, that you would start to change our perspective, what marriage is, what marriage is for, and we would find deep, satisfying life and purpose in that together as we run the race as husbands and wives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What is the purpose of your marriage? Why does your marriage exist? That's the question today. That's the question that you and your spouse need to sit down and answer. And if you're single in this room, you need to answer that question. Why do I want to get married? For what purpose? For what end? Marriage is not the end. It's the team. God has brought you together for a purpose, for a mission. And I wish, I wish I had all day to tell you of the amazing men and women, Priscilla's and Aquila's, here in this church, but I don't have time. I wish that I could tell you about the Davises. I wish I could tell you about the Blicks, the Deckers, the Bedards. I wish I could tell you about these people. I wish I could tell you about Joe and how he's a regular guy. He works as a salesman for J.D. Martin. I wish I could tell you about Brad. I actually don't know what you do, but you're a regular guy. You just work somewhere. I wish I could tell you about Julie, his wife, and how she is shepherding and caring for and discipling women. I wish I could tell you about the men and women, the Kelso. I wish I could tell you about all of these people that I admire, the Fosters, the Browns, that are doing this right. They're not perfect, but they're pursuing God on mission together as a marriage. And that's what I want for us. When you receive the benediction, go. Go and live your life together as husband and wife on mission. 
as much as there is defense to, to manage conflict and to avoid minds and all of those kinds of things that blow up, first, figure out why you're married and pursue that together. Go and pursue the mission of God together as husband and wife. Go and transform this community. Go.